Welcome on back to the Twisted History Podcast. This is the Twisted History of, uh, of listener submissions. This is a Twisted History of a Mixed Bag. This is a Twisted History of just about everything uh, that you guys send in. Uh, once again, it's myself. It's uh, Jeff Vibbert in New York City. It's, uh, it's the St. Anne in, uh, holding it down in Dirty Jersey. And it's uh, John in some, in some undisclosed location. I was just with John down here in San Antonio. John, San Antonio, thoughts? No, John I didn't hate San Antonio. San Antonio. Um, I th- no, we, I, the river walk was nice. A little tainted by the section we were in with like Hard Rock Cafe and like Boca de Chao. No offense to those restaurants, but it was just kind of like, I don't know quite know why you would do that. And it was a little tight. It was a little tight. It, it, like I bet people fall in all, all day. Yeah, I think it's one of the things too is that we're trying to artistically get a feel of San, D, uh, San Antonio where like maybe from a – I don't know, uh, some sort of vantage point where we could film um, some promos for this fight I'm here for. I'm in San Antonio a week for the Emmanuel Tego versus Ryan Garcia fight, and there's not a lot to not a lot to do with that. The Alamo, by the way, is a is the size of a Seven Eleven, right? They it's it's like they were defending a small apartment. We did get some excellent barbecue on our last day, Pinkertons. Glenny Balls loves that place. Uh, he suggested it, and he was right. So that did redeem San Antonio in a, in a big way. I'm going to try it. It's walking distance from my hotel. I, I actually passed by yesterday. I did a little bit of walk. So I'm going to try it, I think, tomorrow. Um, so anyways. How's the, how's the foot holding up? Yeah, so I'm playing hurt, right? I got the shit kicked out of me by Canelo last week. That was what I was going to ask about next, too. Yeah. yeah. How's your stomach? How's your foot? How's everything? Yeah. I'm an absolute mess. Absolute mess, uh, Vibs. But I'm taking this, like, hardcore shit doxycycline. So I'm not boozing which is, you know, I, I like to booze, um, but I'm feeling better. Swelling's going down. I had something called cellulitis. Everybody who's ever had cellulitis has reached out to me because I mentioned it, I think, on Podfathers, and they said I almost lost my foot. Megan making money, almost most lost her middle finger. She was in the hospital for seven days. So it's a real deal thing. I don't, Damn, I don't know. Damn, yeah. That's- yeah. So I don't like to throw around the word hero, but I think here it kind of makes sense. How are you doing, Veg? You doing well? I'm I'm doing well. Yeah, I was gonna say if it's affecting Megan making money, it affects healthy people. So you're you know it's not it's not an unhealthy thing. You're you're healthier than you think you are, large. Because <laughs> I took a little umbrage with that at first. And Ann, you're at home alone. How are you doing? Saying I am. I am. I'm holding down the fort. I'm I'm actually trying to get as much sleep as I can while you're not here snoring. Only because uh, we had a pretty big weekend. Yeah. <laughs> So we just did the uh, hogs for the cause last weekend with Mincy, who's out of his fucking mind. We raised like 50 grand for uh, kids with pediatric cancer. It was a big success, I think, all the way around. So anyway, we're back, or we're not back, but we're all in different places. And uh, we're going to do Twisted History. We're just going to reach into the mailbag. So as promised, listener submissions with a couple of left turns. The first one, um, I, I've... I've had a bunch of different guys reach out to me and I'm a little bit disappointed because I did a TikTok on this guy months ago. I was trying to do like a TikTok a day of some sort of weird historical fact. Um, yeah. So people probably While just on the didn't... toilet, yes. While yes. on the toilet, shirtless. This, I was, this was, yeah. this, was before the, this was before the toilet, I think. I believe okay. it was before the toilet where I was changing hats every day. Yeah. I, I, for the record, I don't film those when you're on the season. toilet. Like do, those one. are the ones I do not film. Yeah, so this was true. This was season one. This was almost the pilot. But people have asked me, multiple people have asked me to tell the story of Boston Corbett. So I will, reluctantly. But I'm going to tell the story of Boston Corbett because as I'm going to get to, I think it's a name that should be a household name for uh, grammar school kids. Like I think right down to grammar school kids should know about this guy. But I don't think many people do. So here's the timeline. Do you, do you know about him? I was gonna say Boston Corbett. Is he like the is he the founder of Boston? Is he who Boston's named after? Yeah, like that's the whole idea. Now you're you're sta- you're standing. I have no idea. You're standing in front of a backdrop, right? So you're standing in mm-hmm. front of a backdrop. Uh, for people who aren't watching this on video, Fibs has the assassination of Lincoln uh, directly behind him. So the guy who's on my right side of the uh, of the picture, who's shooting Lincoln in the head, is a guy by the name of John Wilkes Booth, right? John Wilkes Booth, not too far afterwards, uh, gets killed by a Union soldier, and that Union soldier's name is Boston Corbett. So the man who shot the man who shot the president is who we're going to talk about today. That's not Boston. That's John not Wilkes Boston. Booth, no, he took to he took to the hills, and and it, and he was off. He was a fugitive for a oh, while. Oh, that's I'm, 
Yeah, they yeah, found yeah. him in a barn. Yeah, yeah, they burnt him out. So anyway, here it is. So on April 14th, 1865, it's, it's the scene is right behind Vips right now. Abraham Lincoln, our sixth uh, Lincoln, our sixteenth president of the United States, was shot once in the back of the head by a well-known stage actor at the time, whose name was John Wilkes Booth. Uh, Lincoln was attending a play called Our American Cousin. He was at Ford's Theater in Washington D.C. Everyone knows that, and whoever doesn't know that should know that. That's what happened on April fourteenth, eighteen sixty-five. Abraham Lincoln was the first president of the United States to be assassinated. Okay, those are the facts. The basics. Those are the basics. Those are the basics. Yeah. What a lot of people probably don't know is that his assassin, John Wilkes Booth, then fled on horseback with an accomplice, this guy named David Harold. And twelve days later, so they were on the lam for twelve days before dawn on April twenty-sixth. So twelve days after he shot him on April fourteenth, Union soldiers caught up with the fugitives who were hiding in a tobacco barn somewhere in northern Virginia. So they headed for Z Hills from Washington, D.C. They made it out to Northern Virginia, where they were holed up in a barn. Harold, uh, Wilkes Booth's uh, accomplice, uh, surrendered right away. I'm out, right? But Booth said that he wasn't going out without a fight. So after a small gunfight, the soldiers set the barn on fire to smoke him out. And yeah. as he was scurrying around the barn... One Union soldier had found a crack in the barn wall, and he had fired and killed him. And that Union soldier was Boston Corbett. He fatally shot John Wilkes Booth. One bullet in the back of the head, just like Lincoln, right behind his left ear. As a matter of fact, if you look at the entry point to where Lincoln's bullet and where John Wilkes' bullet uh, both entered their heads, it's almost exactly the same spot, just by coincidence. Not a big deal. Mm -hmm. So the bullet struck Booth. In the back of the head, behind his left ear, it passed through his neck and then out into the barn. He was paralyzed, but he was in severe pain, and he died two hours later from asphyxia. And he had a tough go. He had a tough go for those two hours. Lincoln, um, as I mentioned, survived a little bit, but Lincoln was basically unconscious throughout the whole thing. The two hours that John Wilkes Booth had left on this mortal coil were extremely, extremely painful. And fuck him, right? And in his pocket there was a diary where he had written of Lincoln's death. He said, our country owed all our troubles to him and God simply made me the instrument of his punishment. So that was it. So John Wilkes Booth, a famous stage actor, and I'm talking about famous, John Wilkes Booth assassinating President Lincoln at that time would be the equivalent of Will Smith getting up and slapping the president. <laughs> would be the, yeah. Or Bradley Cooper assassinating Joe Biden. Like that that that's where I kind of put it in line with, right? So Booth kills Lincoln and then Boston Corbett kills Booth. But there was some um, controversy surrounding Corbett's actions. According to Corbett, he fired at Booth because the fugitive had seen him through this crack in the barn, and then raised his pistol to shoot at him. But Lieutenant Colonel Everton Conger, who was leading the troops on this manhunt, reported to his superiors that Corbett shot Booth without order, pretext, or excuse, and recommended that Corbett be punished for disobeying the orders that they wanted to take Booth alive. So Corbett was initially arrested for disobeying the orders, but he was later released on the orders of Secretary of War Edward, Edwin Stanton, who referred to Corbett as the Patriot upon dismissing him, and he was largely considered a hero by the media and the public. So this Secretary of War, Edward Stanton, he was actually this guy, Lieutenant Colonel Everton Conger's boss. He was the guy that originally gave, I want him taken alive, because they wanted to know if this was more of a vast conspiracy to kill Lincoln, and if it went further. As a matter of fact, I think they caught eight men within that conspiracy outside of John Wilkes Booth and four mm -hmm. of them were hanged, right? So that's so that's where we are. We're up to the point where people are still pretty comfortable on how shit went down. But who is Boston Corbett? And I don't think anyone really knows this. And I'm hoping that they don't, except for the four people that wrote in that they want me to tell the story, because I'm going to tell it. Who is Boston Corbett? Vibs didn't know. I don't think you knew any, right? I don't think so. Yeah, so... First off, he was insane. And I'm not throwing around that word lightly. 
He experienced mental issues both during, uh, before, during, and even after the Civil War, which some people blame in part that he had a job as a milliner, as a hat maker, where he was exposed yeah. to uh, fumes of mercury nitrate, which was used in the treatment of fur to produce felt, which is now in hats that are only worn by pimps. But back then, felt hats were all the rage, and the only way that you could treat fur was with a sort of mercury nitrate, and it wound up that any kind of excessive exposure to that mercury compound led to, hallucinis, uh, to hallucinations, psychosis, and then this twitching, which Boston Corbett did have, which was known as the Hatter Shakes. And it's also where we get the term Mad Hatter. So a lot of people mm -hmm. who were milliners back in the day all went fucking crazy. And a lot of it had to do with the fact that they were huffing mercury while they were trying to make felt hats. Okay? So that's this guy's fucking problem. And is there any other reason that I can just flippantly call this guy insane? And there is. He was happily married, which sometimes drive people insane by itself, but then his mm -hmm. wife and his child died during childbirth. And that tends to leave a dent also, right? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so following the deaths of these two people, his wife and his stillborn child, he became a mess. He lost it, started drinking heavily, he was unable to hold a job, and he became homeless. And then he found God, which people tend to do. After a night of heavy boozing, he was confronted by a street preacher who persuaded him to join the Methodist Episcopal Church. He immediately quit booze, and he became devoutly religious. He was baptized, and then he changed his name from Thomas Corbett to Boston Corbett because he was in Boston when he found Jesus. Okay? And then in, Got it. And in an attempt to imitate Jesus, he grew his hair very long, and he started becoming like a street preacher, right? He had to cut his hair when he entered into the Union Army, which he didn't do until 1861. I'm trying to keep people on a timeline. So this is before 1861 when Corbett had joined the Army. Lincoln was shot in 1865. So all of this happened before he even joined the Army. He lost his wife and kid. He was a mad hatter. He found Jesus. He grew his fucking hair out. Okay? This is all before 1961 when he joined the Army. And then this one particular thing happened, which I think makes him extremely interesting. On July 16th, 1858, while he was, while he was working as a hat maker, part-time preacher, long-haired Jesus fucking uh, imitator, Boston Corbett was propositioned by two prostitutes while working home from a church, while walking home from a church meeting, you know, he was yeah. deeply disturbed, but he was also aroused by the encounter. He got hard. So when he got back to the room at his boarding house, he began reading chapters 18 and 19 in the gospel of Matthew in the Bible, which read this. I'm going to quote the Bible here. I love doing this. And if thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee. And there be eunuchs, which have made themselves eunuchs, for the kingdom of heaven's sake. So this deeply religious guy bumps into a couple of prostitutes. They say, hey, can we take your top off? Hey, can we, you know, whatever? And he was like, no, no, I'm not into it. But all of a sudden got a little bit uh, excited by it, consults the Bible, and he happens to read the one about plucking eyes out and making units. So as any sane hatter would do in order to further uh, avoid any kind of hard-ons, he castrated himself with a pair of scissors. And then oh. when I say castrate, a lot of people don't even know what that means anymore. You're cutting the balls off, right? So that's what he does. He cuts his he cuts his own balls off. The stem is intact. I'm really yeah. not sure. Did, did you know that's castration? I think some people are fucked up about that. Um, I think after watching uh, like Game of Thrones, I figured that out. But no, I, I used to think it was, was ev like everything, I guess. Right. And, I, and it's not. So it's just it's as not, I, yeah. Can you, I don't know, can you still achieve an erection without a set of balls? Yeah, I think, yeah, yeah, I would know. Uh, <laughs> no, I think you can. All right. Otherwise, you just don't have the, you don't have the, uh, the yeah, the cum. You, don't, you can't cum. Right, I would assume that you can't generate anything. I'd have to yeah. ask Will Smith. Whoa. So he did this to himself. He castrated himself with a pair of scissors. Then he went to a meal, he went to a prayer meeting, and then he went to seek but, medical treatment. Can I say this? Oh. Uh, after, I haven't, I haven't, I don't know about 
testicles, but whenever we cut through the bull penis that we had on lowering the bar, yes, it is. It's. I assume a human's is pretty similar. It's thick. Like getting through there with a pair of scissors, like you've got to really go deep and really put some muscle into it. Like it's it's not easy. Right, because just it's, throwing that out there. Like it's, right. it's tougher. It's really tough. It doesn't slice like butter. Yeah, I think the reason you're throwing it out there is because that little expertise that you have will not come up in conversation hardly ever. So if anybody yeah. ever talks about slicing the dick, you should be the guy who steps up and talks about it. So I got no problem. It's a mess. It's a mess. So this is my problem. <clears throat> you don't learn this shit in school for some reason. This guy went crazy from mercury, right, which people should know about. He chopped off his own balls. He then joined – this was all before he then joined the army. He was at one point court-martialed and sentenced to death while he was in the army for insubordination but was instead discharged. He re-enlisted and was a POW in Andersonville prison for a stretch, which is not a nice place. No. Right? And then he shot the man who shot Abraham Lincoln – and one of the things that I like about the probably the best is that he was almost he was only five foot three, so remember that all my short, short kids out there, five foot three, Boston Corbett, and he did all this. He was five foot three, and he survived Andersonville Prison as a Union soldier in the Civil War, and that means a lot more than people would think. And I'm going to tell you why. I don't know if you guys remember, but I spoke about Anderson Prison once before. We talked about it during the Twisted History of Prisons, which you and I had done, Jeff, a long time ago, right? We did the gulag. We touched on Andersonville Prison. But we also talked about it in depth, in depth during the Twisted History of Eugenics, which you and I definitely did. That wasn't a good, that wasn't a good one for us, right? No. Nobody felt good about the eugenics one. No. And I veered off topic at some point during the Twisted History of Eugenics because I was trying to differentiate between concentration camps and extermination camps, right? So concentration camps, prison camps, internment camps, and extermination camps. I was trying to give people an idea of what the difference was. And then I was trying to tell people that even though we speak about all these different camps, a lot of people think that it only happens in Europe. A lot of people think that it only happened in China, or it only happened in Japan, or it only happened in, obviously, in Nazi Germany. But I was trying to tell them how much it happened here in the U.S. So I'll touch upon it again. Right. Because I think it's important. Right. And, and the way that I do it is like how like imagine being in charge uh, during the U.S. Civil War or any war, war in Ukraine or whatever, if you're being charged, but particularly in the U.S. Civil War. How do you mm -hmm. deal with the tremendous amount of prisoners taken on either side? And this has always fascinated me, like the spoils of war. When you take somebody prisoner, they surrender and you can't kill them. What do you do with them? It's not easy. Like 1861 yeah. to 1865 in the United States of America, which wasn't united at the time, neither side had the means, meaning enough prisons, for dealing with this huge amount of captured troops. So the Union and the Confederate governments both relied on this traditional Northern European system of parole and exchange of prisoners. And what they would do then is that a prisoner who was on parole promised not to fight again until his name was exchanged for a similar man on the other side. So if you were a private and you were caught, you were essentially let back to go home, but you couldn't go back to war unless a private from the other side was released to his home. And it was sort of a gentleman's agreement to a certain degree, right? But if both men were exchanged, then they could both rejoin their units. But then that exchange system, which worked for a little while, broke down in mid-1863 when the Confederacy, which was starting to lose, refused to treat black prisoners as equal to white prisoners. They were slaves, not soldiers. There were a lot of black soldiers who fought for the North, and if they were captured by Southern troops, they weren't treated as equals. So the system broke down, and we had to go back to just prisoners. We had to just go back to prison camps. But prisons are expensive. They're tough to mm -hmm. set up. Nobody wants one in their backyard. They're tough to staff because it's fucking dangerous. Many people in prison have nothing to lose. So prison camps, particularly when they are able to be put together, they were fucking dangerous dumps. 
The overall monthly rate in prisons on both sides were similar as far as mortality goes. And by similar, I mean they were both very, very high. And many southern prisons were located in regions with high disease rates, and they were routinely short on medicines, doctors, food, and even ice. It was tough being a prisoner and wanting to have a cold drink in the South. So because our prisoners, I'm yeah. saying as a northerner, were being treated so poorly in the South, and I'm getting to my point here, the northerners were then demanding that conditions in northern prisons be purposely lessened to torture the men there, even though shortages of supplies like ice and medicine were not as uh, prevalent in the rich north, right? So the north were like, we're getting yeah. fucked so let's turn our prisons into dumps too. And eye for an eye. People. Yeah, absolutely. So about 56,000 soldiers died just in prisons during the war. That accounted for 10% of all Civil War fatalities. So one in 10 Civil War deaths weren't from battlefields or from executions. These were from people who were just trying to be housed. One in 10. That's a lot. During a period of 14 months during the Civil War, Andersonville, where our man Corbett was, had 13,000 of their 45,000 Union soldiers die. 28% of the Union soldiers in 14 months died in Andersonville, Georgia. And I mentioned Andersonville because, right, Boston did his stretch there. And yep. it's the only prisoner camp from the Civil War that was called out and ultimately punished. The guy who was in charge there was somebody named Henry Verse, Captain Henry Verse, who was a Swiss American officer of the Confederate Army during the American Civil War. And he eventually became the commandant of the stockade in Andersonville, Georgia, where, as I just mentioned, inhumane conditions led to high mortality rates of Union detainees. When the Civil War ended on April 9th, 1865, 1865, April 9th, so three days from now, but a long time ago. When Robert E. Lee surrendered the last major Confederate army to Ulysses S. Grant at, uh, at Appomattox, right? That was April 9th. May 7th, less than a month after that, Wirtz was arrested. He was taken to Washington, D.C., and they put him on trial for conspiring to impair the lives of Union prisoners of war. So that's less than a month. This guy is already up on stage being tried. In November mm -hmm. of 1865... Just a couple of months after that, right? The war just ended in April. By November of that year, the military commission announced that it found Wirtz guilty of conspiracy and charged along with 11 acts of personal cruelty, and he was sentenced to death. He wrote a letter to President Andrew Johnson, but the letter went unanswered. President Johnson said, fuck you. He was hanged, not hung. He was hanged on November 10th, 1865 at the old Capitol Prison in Washington, D.C., located right next to the U.S. Capitol, and they even fucked that up. It was one of those ones from executions where they fucked it up. His neck didn't break in the fall. So it was one of those things, there was 200 spectators around, and another 120, there. yeah, 120 armed guards, two, so there's 350 people watching this public hanging. They drop the guy, but they don't set the noose right, so his neck doesn't uh, snap. And instead, all 350 people had to watch while he sat there and, and like kind of wriggled until he strangled yeah. to death, and it took over 10 minutes. Okay? They need like, they need like a club that you can just like... <laughs> they do. They need to, it's the, the technology with hanging is not very good. No. Yeah, I can say that confidently. And I'm, the only reason I'm stressing this is because this is the U.S. Civil War. This is a big boy, right? This is a U.S. Civil War. It wasn't some sort of small skirmish. And worse was only one of two men tried, convicted, and executed for war crimes. That whole fucking war, there was only two men who were tried, convicted, and executed for war crimes. And the other one was this sick bastard, his name was Champ Ferguson, who had killed over 100 Union soldiers plus Union civilians, and he was convicted of 53 murders. So a guy who murdered 53 people was hanged, makes a lot of sense. And then the guy who ran Andersonville Prison was fucking hanged, right? But right. this hellish prison where the fucking warden was hung, this little weirdo, Boston Corbett, survived it, right? And I would say he has some set of balls, but we all know that he doesn't, right? So now right. Boston Corbett goes through all of this shit.
kills the guy who kills the president. We all know about him. What eventually happened to him? The war ends, and he started to bounce around the United States, getting job just off of his reputation as being Lincoln's Avenger. He's a stud. He's an American hero for all intents and purposes. But he's mm -hmm. still crazy. So after a couple of run-ins with the law, a judge declared him legally insane and sent him to the Topeka Asylum for the Clinically Insane. Topeka Asylum for the Clinically Insane, which doesn't sound like a nice place to be. And, and it's, Kansas. And it still isn't fucking over. On May 26th, 1888, at the age of 66, Boston Corbett escaped from the asylum on fucking horseback and is believed to have settled in a cabin that he built in the forest near Hinkley, Minnesota. And then he's also believed to have died in the Great Hinkley Fire on September 1st, 1895, 1894, there's no proof except the name Thomas Corbett, his original name before he changed it to Boston, appears on the list of the dead and the missing. So that's Boston Corbett. That's a wow. that's that's a mouthful, right? Like we try to we try to find people in history that everybody knows about. Abraham Lincoln is one of them, John Wilkes Booth to agree, but you don't know everything about John Wilkes Booth, and I'm gonna get to that. Boston Corbett should be somebody that you know intimately, and I think now you do. Right? What a good side character, yeah. Mm -hmm. What a good side character of history. And I don't think there's a comp to him. Like, Lee Harvey Oswald has got some interesting stories, right? Like, Lee Harvey Oswald yeah. is a fucking freak and all that stuff. But considering this guy, chopping his own balls off, doing the Jesus thing for a while, being sentenced to death, getting out, shooting the guy who shot the president... You know what I mean? Then escaping from the clinically insane, doing a stretch yeah. in Andersonville prison, setting up a thing and dying in the Great Fire of 1894. There should be something named after him, I would think. Um, all right, so that's Boston Corbett. I should move on from this topic, but I won't. Because as much as I want everyone to know about the man who shot the man who shot Lincoln, I also want people to know that the man who shot Lincoln was a whore master. And this I knew. Did you know about this? Did you know that John Wilkes Booth was a fucking coxman? I mean, if you're a stud actor, yeah, you got to be a coxman. Right. I mentioned that they found the diary I it was on no him. no different now than it was then. Yeah. I mentioned that they found the diary on him, right? But they also found yes. a compass on him, which makes sense, right? Because they also found a candle on him, which makes sense. I think they found some tobacco on him. But they also found a picture of five different women tucked into his diary. Had a picture of five different women. And there was a book oh, yeah. written in 2018 by a guy named E. Lawrence Abel. It was John Wilkes Booth and the women who loved him. And those five women that he had in his diary were all romantically involved with the 26-year-old handsome actor. So he was banging five women at one time, kept all their pictures on him as he was on the lam from shooting the president. And this is the story of those women. Four of them were actresses. The first was one named Fanny Brown who was hailed as the most beautiful woman on the American stage. She played Lady Anne to Booth's Richard III in 1863. And when they were on the road, they always had separate rooms, but they always had separate rooms that had adjoining doors because they were uh, banging like fucking minxes. You know that fucking trip, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah it's, the old, it's the oldest trick in the book. The second one was Alex Gray. And she was the last person to be Booth's leading lady. And she used to be leading lady to Booth's brother, Edwin Booth, but Booth stole her away from his brother. So John Wilkes Booth came from a storied line of actors. His father was an actor, his brother was an actor, and like I said, he was an accomplished actor. This girl, mm -hmm. Alice Gray, was spending time with his brother. I believe he was jealous of it, so he hired her for one of his stage things, took her on the road, and then took her down the road. All right, so that's the second one, Alice Gray. The third one is Effie German. Effie German. it's German with an O. And she was also an actress, a pretty actress. And you can still see her because she was the model for the goddess who sits alongside George Washington on that big fresco inside the U.S. Capitol Dome. So if you're ever in the wow. U.S. Capitol Dome and you see that thing where it's like a goddess next to George Washington, that goddess, the model for that, John Wilkes Booth, was banging from behind. And then the fourth actress was somebody named Helen Western, who I know nothing about. and I'm, I'm okay with that. And then the fifth woman, because there were five pictures, the fifth was not an actress. It was Lucy Lambert Hale, who 
who is Booth's secret fiance, as well as the daughter of Lincoln's ambassador to Spain. I think the guy was a senator at one time. So he was he was secretly engaged to the daughter of Lincoln's ambassador to Spain. And it was said that he just did that so he could get an idea, like get close to Lincoln and, and all his kind of like scheduling and all that kind of shit. So anyway, five women he's banging at the time that he gets killed, right? And those women were just the tip of the iceberg as far as Booth's love affairs. And then that book that I mentioned before goes into all the rest of the relationships that he had with about two dozen other women, which were mainly actresses, but were also some high-class prostitutes, whore master, and then some civilians. He used to bang his fans. And on two occasions, one of the things that guys kind of fantasize about is sometimes banging twin sisters, right? Twins and shit like that, like Austin Power and whatnot. And twins. Right. So the court, Booth, the court commercial? Yeah. Right. Not twins, but Booth on two occasions had banged pairs of sisters. The first were these two, Helen and Lucille Western, who call themselves the Star Sisters, and they had this cross-dressing act where they dressed kind of racily in men's clothing. Helen mm -hmm. became involved with Booth during a two-week performance they put together in Portland, Maine, and jealous of her uh, relationship, Booth, uh, Lucille quit the Star Sisters acts, and the two never performed again. So he banged Lucille first, then he started banging Helen. Lucille found out about it. The act was dissolved. The second set of sisters that he broke up was Henrietta and Mary Irving. The two sisters were touring together in Albany, New York, when Booth began seeing Henrietta. However, one night, Henrietta caught him sneaking out of Marie's uh, hotel room. So now this sister is pissed off. She gets a dagger. She goes over to stab him in the heart. Booth deflects the fucking dagger, and it cuts him in the face. She's so distraught by it, she stabs herself in the bosom. She survives. Yeah. Booth survives. He has a scar on his face that he covers up with his long hair every now and again. But that had cool. happened. So this guy is a real, is a real fucking whore master. And as he's going through all these public scandals with sisters and all this stuff, it's very well documented in the papers and whatnot. So he's known as a Lothario. So I guess it's like mm. a Leonardo DiCaprio type guy. So it's like Leonardo DiCaprio then tried to shoot Joe Biden. And even after the assassination of Lincoln and his own death, it didn't deter women who were enamored with him. One of the most successful New York actresses, a woman by the name of Maggie Mitchell, admitted decades later that she kept a lock of John Wilkes Booth's hair in her fucking wallet, calling it the loveliest hair in the world. So I want to make sure people know that the man who shot the man who shot Lincoln was batshit crazy. And I want people to know that the man who shot Lincoln also destroyed countless Hollywood vaginas. Okay. Nothing wrong with that. Now I'm taking a break because I want to know if you want to destroy some vaginas. If the answer is yes, then a good way to do it is with Roman swipes. Roman swipes are clinically proven to help you last longer when you're having sexual relations with a woman or with a man. I don't know why I'm being so homophobic on that one. It doesn't matter. Love is yeah. love. Yeah. Two holes in a heartbeat. Roman swipes are clinically proven as a way to last longer in bed. They're effective, they're easy to use, and they're fast acting. And you don't need a prescription. All you do is you receive these in a discreet, unmarked package, tuck one in your wallet. When you're ready to go, John Wilkes Booth would often take one out, swipe it on, let it dry, and his cock was harder than a diamond in the snow. They're super easy to use. Go get them right now. How do I get them? You go to GetRoman.com slash Twisted. G-E-T-R-O-M-A-N. GetRoman.com slash Twisted. And you'll get your first month of swipes for just $5 when you choose a monthly plan. That's GetRoman.com slash Twisted. If you listen to us every week, and I hope that you guys do, you got to be curious about whether or not these things work by now. You might, you, don't you, you just want to try it. So GetRoman.com slash Twisted. And see, she probably deserves it, or he probably deserves it. Whoever you're putting yourself inside of deserves it. Get Roman.com slash twisted. At least go to the website, take a peek, at least, yeah. figure out what it's about. There is so much good shit on that website. So much good shit that people don't want to talk about on that website. So go to getroman.com and check it out. And if you want to slash twisted, you get the swipes for uh, some money off.
All right. So I'm going to move along. This is uh, sent to me specifically from a guy named John G. J-O-N. So I guess his full name is Jonathan. And the last initial G. That's how he signed on. I think it was Twitter, not uh, maybe. Old, maybe it was old, old Johnny G. Old Johnny G. And he wanted me to tell the story of the town bully from uh, Skidmore, Missouri. It was a town bully from Skidmore, Missouri. And so I'm going to tell it. And again, I don't know about this. I don't think you guys knew about this either. Right? I, I mean, if you knew about a town bully from Skidmore, Missouri, it'd be pretty fucking pathetic. Uh, no, no. All right. Prepare to get pathetic, right? On July 10th, 1981, so not that long ago, this is an ancient history, there was a guy mm -hmm. whose name was Ken Rex McElroy. Right away, that's a shady name. That's a fucking shady name. Not Kenneth. Three He's got three names. Yeah, it's not Kenneth. Uh, I don't know what Rex would be short for, but it's Ken Rex McElroy. And this is what happened on July 10th, 1981. 1981, remember that. He was killed in broad daylight, one, and he was killed in broad daylight in front of plenty of eyewitnesses, so two. Actually, there's a book written about it, and it's called In Broad Daylight, if you want to read more about this shit. But regardless of those two facts, locals in Skidmore, Missouri, were hesitant to speak about it or point fingers. So, people love to talk about cold cases. We have another podcast on this, uh, on this whatever, on Barstool that just does cold cases. The one with uh, Minahin, right? People love to talk about cold cases. So here's one. Despite the fact that there were nearly 50 eyewitnesses to McElroy's death, inside a tiny hamlet tucked away in the northwest corner of Missouri in 1981, investigators still have no idea who killed him. Okay, so that's what, 40 some odd years? 40 some odd years, 50 eyewitnesses, small town. Why is that? Why don't people know what happened to Ken Rex McElroy? And the answer is probably another question. Who the fuck was Ken Rex McElroy, right? And it winds up he's right. a bad guy. So Ken was born in 1934. He was the 15th of 16 children to poor migrant tenant farming uh, couple named Tony and Mabel McElroy. They had moved between Kansas and the Ozarks before settling outside of Skidmore. So I looked at the Ozarks because I never knew exactly where they were. I liked the show. But it looks like they touched part of Kansas – then Missouri, and the yeah. South they do Oklahoma and Arkansas, and they might touch a little bit of Illinois in the, in the southwest corner of Illinois. I'm really not too sure, right? So that's where yeah. the Ozarks are. Like that's I, I feel like, country. Yeah, I feel like Kansas and kind of Missouri is the last place I'd want to be in 1934. You got the Depression, the Dust Bowl. Right. Yeah, no, it's, it's, and it's not it's good. It's miserable. And you don't want to be one of 15. You don't want to be the 15th of 16 children either. You no. know what I mean? Your mom's no. uterus is just about falling out and whatever. So now you settle into the Ozarks in 1934. But that's where the guy grew up. And in decades preceding his murder, McElroy terrorized the citizens of Skidmore, Missouri. And what do I mean by terrorized? I mean it very literally. He was accused or suspected of dozens of crimes, including theft, livestock rustling, which is a huge no-no, burglary, arson, mm -hmm. assault, rape, and child molestation. It got worse. Yeah. So he's a thief. He's a rustler. He burgles. He was an arsonist. He was an assaulter. He was a rapist. And he was a child molester. That's hitting for the fucking... Bingo! Like, that's hitting for the cycle. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> if you have all those. He was charged 21 times in theft cases, but was said to have avoided conviction through witness intimidation, either by direct confrontation or by simply parking his truck outside of their home. So he was kind of a bad, a badass. McElroy, mm -hmm. when he was 32, raped a 12-year-old girl. Her name was Trina McLeod. And to avoid statutory rape charges, he divorced his wife at the time, Alice, and married Trina when she was 14 and pregnant with their baby. Okay, so she's pregnant now. She's fourteen to avoid statutory rape, right? Like, and we talked right. about this before. That's that loophole, Andy. We spoke about it too. Like the loophole, especially in Italy, we had that one heroic girl. One of the things you can do to avoid rape charges, particularly statutory rape charges, is marry your victim. So his real wife Alice, who I think was already his second wife, stepped aside, became his common law wife, and he married this girl Trina. Right? That's fucking terrible. But how did he get the parents of Trina, who he just raped, to agree to the marriage? 
Well, he burnt the house down. He burnt their house down, and then he shot their dog. And that kind of forced them into the marriage. Didn't kill the dog. But then oh. once the marriage occurred, the family came and whisked Trina and his baby away. And they hid out in another house. And what did uh, Ken Rex do? He burnt that house down. He found the same dog and he shot it again. So he shot the same dog twice. This is a bad fucking guy. He's petty. He's petty. I kind of <laughs> respect that he's petty. But I don't yeah. like that he's shooting dogs. Yeah. So McElroy transferred Trina to the house he lived in now with his Commonwealth spouse, Alice. Spouse Alice. And he continued making kids with Alice following his wedding to Trina. So in total, Ken Rex McElroy had 11 different offspring with three different mothers. So he was prolific. Probably used Roman swipes. Mm -hmm. So in July 1976, McElroy. So we're going to get to this point. Uh, this is the guy who was killed and who nobody saw nothing. Right? So I'm, I'm, I'm 50, building 50 case. eyewitnesses saw 50 nothing. 50 eyewitnesses. They yeah. didn't see shit. In July 1976, so it's five years before he was killed, McElroy pulled a shotgun on a farmer named Romaine Henry and shot the man in the stomach. Henry survived, and McElroy was charged with the assault with intent to kill, but when the matter came to trial, McElroy's attorney produced a pair of raccoon hunters who testified that they were hunting with McElroy the day that the guy was shot and he was nowhere near the scene of the shooting, and as a result, McElroy was found not guilty. Then in 1980, he didn't get so lucky. One of McElroy's children, who were also fucking punks, got into an argument with a clerk in a local grocery store that was owned by 70-year-old Ernest Bo Bowenkamp. So this 70-year-old guy named Bo. You can imagine, if you're 70 years old, your name is Bo, and you own a fucking candy store in Skidmore, Missouri, you're probably an absolute sweetheart. So McElroy's yeah. punk-ass kid comes in, tries to steal uh, candy, Bo takes umbrage with it, and then so does McElroy, right? McElroy began stalking the Bo Camp family and eventually threatened Bo in the back of his store with a shotgun in hand. In the ensuing confrontation, McElroy shot Bone Camp in the neck. Bone Camp survived, and McElroy this time was arrested and charged with attempted murder and was convicted of the assault, but was let out of j a jail as he was awaiting his appeal. So this time the shit's hitting the fan, but he's out of jail awaiting appeal. And during his time out, he went about making public threats against Bowen Camp while armed with the rifle, which brings us to 1981. All right, so now we're up here in 1981. On the morning of July 10th, 1981, townspeople met at Legion Hall in the center of town with the county sheriff. This was in Nodaway County. That doesn't mean anything. But the county sheriff, not from Skidmore, was this guy, Dan Estes. They called him in. They said, nobody is fucking doing anything about this guy. Help us out, right? Help us out. There was a shitload of people congregated there. During the meeting, McElroy happened to arrive at a tavern across the street. So now this convicted killer shows up to have a couple of beers at the D&G Cat Tavern across the street while a huge group of people are meeting in the town square to talk <laughs> with the county sheriff about this scumbag across the street who may or may not get away with shooting Bo Bowenkamp in the fucking neck. That All right? sweet, sweet man. So this is perfect, right? So all these people in the Legion Hall who are talking to the sheriff knew that this guy is now in town. And Sheriff Essed instructed the assembled group not to get into a direct confrontation with McElroy, but instead consider forming a neighborhood watch program. Then he drove out of town in his police cruiser, which kind of implicates him. He got the fuck out of Dodge because I think he knew it was going to happen. And the citizens, fed up with being abandoned and fed up with the state's legal failures, decided to go to the fucking tavern. They waited outside, and after McElroy finished his drinks, he purchased a six-pack of beer, left the bar with his wife, Trina. This was the girl he had raped when he was 12, and he went to his pickup truck. Him and Trina were parked on Skidmore's Main Street, again, in broad daylight, when they were confronted by a mob of 46... They said less than 50, 46 angry town residents. Several bullets were fired into the vehicle as McElroy attempted to smoke a cigarette from the packet he just purchased. He reached into his pocket to grab a cigarette and he got shot. Trina shouted in terror as he was hit in the neck and the head. He was fatally shot twice by two different guns and the crowd of an estimated 46 saw nothing. No one saw a thing. 
No one called an ambulance. No one even turned off his fucking pickup truck when Trina had run out. Trina claimed to have seen the shooter, but no person corroborated her story. All of those other people either couldn't identify the assailant or said that they didn't see the incident. Local prosecutors denied to press charges, not that there was a person to press charges against, and even with a federal investigation, nothing came of it. Since mm -hmm. then, the FBI has conducted almost 100 separate investigations and have been unable to locate even one bit of evidence linking anyone to McElroy's untimely death, all because the residents of Skidmore refused to speak. That's, that's extraordinary. Like in New York City, which is a terrible example, in Ridgewood, New Jersey, which we're getting a little bit closer, in whatever town you grew up in, in Indiana, we're probably getting even closer still. It's impossible to have 50 fucking people keep their mouths closed about a murder that happened in town square in broad daylight for 50 goddamn years. So that's yeah. how bad this jerk off was. It's a, yeah, it's a, that's a close community. 100%. That's, that's advantages of being close. You don't get any snitches in the Snitches in the get snitches, yeah. Right. McElroy's widow sued the attorney general's office and the governor's office for the alleged negligence in 1984, so three years after her husband was gunned down. And despite the fact that she was demanding $6 million in 1984, the case was settled for around 17 grand. They gave her a check for 17 grand, and neither party acknowledged any fault. They gave her 17 grand and told her to shut the fuck up. They said the explanation for the suit's demise was a wish to prevent incurring extra expensive attorney fees. So that's the there was no there was no acknowledgement of guilt at all. They said we don't want to do the attorney's fees. Trina has 16 grand, 17 grand, shut the fuck up, and she took it. Trina ultimately married again. She moved away from Skidmore and she died in Lebanon, Missouri, which sounds lovely, in January of 2012. So she moved on a little bit, right? But like I said before, there's a 1988 book about McElroy's murder. It's called In Broad Daylight. But if it was also adapted into a made-for-TV movie, uh, made movie called In Broad Daylight, and it's starring Brian Dennehy, one of my favorite actors. So that was made in 1991. So if you want to hear about this or look about it more, In Broad Daylight with Brian Dennehy and Marsha Gay Harden and Chris Cooper. It sounds like an okay one. I don't know. But um, so that's that's the story of Ken Rex McElroy that people wanted me to tell. That's now told, and I'm not stopping there, right? There's that there's that word that became popular. I think Dennis Miller used it first. It's called sh uh, Schadenfreude. Sch Schadenfreude is how it's pronounced. You've heard of it, right? Schadenfreude? It's a German word. I, I don't believe so, no. So Dennis Miller, I think, was the first one to use it in one of his books. That's where I first read it. And it's called Schadenfreude. Spelt with a name, it's called Schadenfreude. And it's uh, a German word that specifically means pleasure that comes from the troubles of another. Like if you don't like somebody and you see them stub their toe, the feeling that you get of happiness from watching an enemy stub their toe is simply called Schadenfreude, right? Mm -hmm. There's all these different words in different languages that sum up broader situations perfectly. So I experienced like the Munchausen by proxy. Yeah, like all those ones kind of just mm -hmm. they wrap up all these more elaborate ideas. Japanese do it too. You know what I mean? They're good though. They're usually good words, like Schadenfreude and Munchausen by proxy. Like they're all good words. And so the one because they make me wonder. So the one for this is just as good. So what had happened to Ken Rex is actually called Fuentio Bejuna. Fuentio Bejuna. It's a Spanish word. Sounds delicious. It does. And it's actually, I pronounce it Bejuna, but it's with a V, but it sounds too much like vagina. But it is pronounced as the as the B. <laughs> Fuenteo Bejuna, right? It's a Spanish right. word. I'm going to tell you about it now because now you know. Schadenfreude is when something bad happens to somebody that you hate and you take pleasure in it. Fuente mm -hmm. Bejuna is a Spanish word that's derived from a play that was written in the 17th century by Lope de Vega. It's a great name. And it was based upon a historical incident that took place in the village of Fuente Bejuna in Castile way back in 1476. While under the command of an evil guy named Fernan Gomez de Guzman, villagers banded together and killed him. So this guy was like raping people and stealing and all this stuff. He was like this really evil magistrate. So the villagers all got together and killed the shit out of him. When somebody else sent by the king arrived at the village to investigate, the villagers, even under the threat of torture, 
responded by only saying Fuente Bejuna did it. So like, you know, nobody would fuck, no, no loose lips in that thing. So yeah. Skidmore, Missouri is the modern day incarnation of Fuente Bejuna. Okay. So remember that Shaden Freud, Fuente Bejuna. And I'm not yep. done with Skidmore, Missouri. Right. So this shit happened in a tiny town, Skidmore. But where have I talked about Skidmore before? A town with now has a population of less than 300. It used to have a population of about 500. Skidmore has a population of less than 300 right now, according to most recent censuses. But yet it showed up now twice in such a prestigious podcast, today and mm -hmm. one time former. And there's no way you'll remember this, but the time that it showed up one time before, do you remember any? I don't. I don't. Uh, yeah. Skidmore, I mean, Skidmore sounds like a small town, just the name Skidmore just in the episode that we did about executions we showed up uh we discussed somebody named lisa montgomery and lisa mm -hmm. montgomery happened to be from skidmore missouri so if you look up skidmore missouri google the shit out of it and its wiki page yep. has the fact that ken rex got uh, killed there it has an annual pumpkin festival that's supposed to be off the charts and that thirdly lovely. it's the uh it's a scene of the crime for lisa montgomery we talked about her early in February 2021, just as Trump's term had come to an end. And there was a stretch there. I don't know if you remember, but there were three federal death row inmates executed in the span of four days. That's why mm -hmm. I did the twisted history of executions, because people yeah. were being put to death pretty quickly in those four days. So the week after that, we did it. And one of the people who was put to death in January of 2021 in those four days was Lisa Montgomery, and her nickname was a terrible one. It was the Womb Raider. The Womb I remember Raider. her. She was the only female inmate on federal death row in the U.S. at the time. She received a lethal injection on January 13th at the federal prison in Terre Haute, Indiana, right? After a last-minute stay of execution was lifted by the U.S. Supreme Court. So she died in Indiana. She's a 52-year-old. She strangled a pregnant woman. She strangled a pregnant woman before cutting out and kidnapping the baby in Skidmore, Missouri in 2004. So that's why they called her. She it. made her think she was her friend. Like she like friend her and she was, that was, that was a horror. And then she cut her open. Yeah. She cut her open, yeah. killed her. She let her bleed to death. Kidnapped the baby. The victim, Bobby Jo Stinnett, bled to death, but her baby was safely recovered and returned to her family. That baby that was cut out just turned 18 years old. That's fucking crazy. And each I would change my birthday. Yeah, because each birthday that this baby has yeah. is the anniversary of a mother's mm -hmm. brutal fucking of a one hundred percent. I'd have to pick a different yeah. day. I'd go with like my due date. Yeah, I would too. You know, imagine that. Like people born on nine eleven or people born on this or people born on yeah. people born on Christmas aren't right in the head. We all know that. Mm -hmm. Like imagine being yeah. born on the same day your mother was fucking eviscerated. So Montgomery became the first female federal prisoner executed in sixty seven years. And the first woman executed in the United States since Kelly Gisender in 2015 for killing her husband. Only three other women have been executed by the U.S. federal government. In 1865, Mary Surratt was hanged for the conspiracy of Abraham Lincoln. See how it's a full circle on this fucking podcast? In 1953, Ethel Rosenberg was put in the electric chair for uh, providing top secret information about radar, sonar, jet propulsion, and nuclear weapon designs to the Russians. She was a fucking spy, I think, along with her husband. And then in yeah. 1953, Bonnie Hetty was put in the gas chamber after the drug-addicted alcoholic kidnapped and killed the six-year-old son of a multimillionaire auto dealer. And that's it. Other than those three, the only other woman to be executed by the U.S. federal government was the womb raider, and she was from Skidmore, Mizzou, along with Ken Rex McElroy from this little town who would have fucking thunk it. So you asked wow. me to tell the story of the bully of Skidmore, Missouri. I'm telling you everything about Skidmore, Missouri. There's nothing else left for it. And there you go. Right? I like that. I like that one. Wow. Yeah. I'm going to close with one more. I'm going to close with one more. And I'm going to close with a uh, what's essentially just a star day in the life. But first, okay. I have this okay. new product I'm experimenting with. I want to talk to you about it. Super Speciosa. Have you fucked with this Kratom stuff yet? No, not yet. It's, it's sitting on my desk at work. I'm doing it now. Like, so yeah? I'm, I'm experiencing all this. What do you think? I, I like it. Super Speciosa is the name of the company. 
What they are selling is kratom, which is an all-natural herb related to the coffee plant that's been used in Thailand for centuries. It helps you energize your mind and relax your body, and it just makes you feel good without feeling impaired. That's what their tagline is. It helps you feel good without feeling impaired. And the only ingredient is pure kratom leaf. That's it. All of their batches come with certified lab reports so you know exactly what you're getting. And like, so people have been quoted as saying that it's an extra boost of energy in the morning. They use it almost like a coffee replacement. Mm -hmm. Other people say they use it to wind down and relax after work. Other people say in smaller servings, it's a pre-workout routine or a post-workout recovery. I spoke to PFT and he said that he took it during the times he had COVID when he was sore. So I've been sore, right, from getting beat up by Canelo Alvarez. Oh, yeah. And I can tell you, I've been taking two of these pills every night for the past five days. And every night I feel better and I'm sleeping well. So I don't know where the energizing thing is because it's more of a relaxing energy. Like instead of feeling the effects of anything, it, it's given me a pretty good head. It's totally different than 3 Chi. Yeah. 3 Chi makes me giggly, right? It makes me hee hee hee. Like yeah. and I love 3 Chi for, you know, for that. Makes this you want to watch here, it. Yeah. So I, anyway, I've only used the capsules. They sell it in a bunch of other stuff in powdered form where you can mix it and all that kind of stuff. The capsules seem to be the way to go about it for people who are just starting. So go to the um, – Go to the to the website and see what you can see, but know that my experience so far has been a positive one. You have to go to getsuperleaf.com slash history. And with that promo code, you're going to get 20% off. Okay? Getsuperleaf.com slash history. You can read up all about this kratom, right? And you can get 20% off with this promo code history. Okay, so give it a try if you'd like to. Like I said, I've been using it. I don't normally sleep in, in hotels too well, but it's been a pretty relaxing type thing. Mm -hmm. I don't see it as a pre-workout thing, maybe a post-workout recovery. It's working for me so far. They sell Kratom, and it's at GetSuperLeaf.com slash history. I think this is a good one. We're going to yep. close out on this. Like I said, we're going to close out on a, a historic day in the life sent to me by okay. someone who has the handle Robespierre. That's the guy's name, Robespierre. Like the other guy, John G., or everyone who's like, you know, Chubby Dixworth. This guy's handle is Robespierre. And as a history guy, that is a fucking doozy of a name. Robespierre, I love. And I'm going to mention him to you right now before okay. I even go to this guy's story. Because Robespierre was probably one of the most influential guys in the French Revolution. I didn't write any of this shit down. I'm just going to talk about it. And the reason I'm going to talk about it is because much like my man Corbett, Robespierre was only five foot three. So another short king I'm talking about here. Yeah. Right? Robespierre was one of the guys who was in charge during the French Revolution. And because of him, he was looking to uh, all men give equality to all men, almost like destroy a caste system. Didn't believe in like women or anything like that. But in order to achieve that equality, he didn't care how many men he had to kill. So he had sent about 17,000 people at least to the guillotine. So this is a French Revolution. This is the late 1700s. People's heads are being chopped off by the hundreds, if not the thousands, 17,000 of which were put there by Robespierre. Okay? Robespierre died in 1794. What happened in 1794? The shit hit the fan during the French Revolution. So he was then taken into custody and was about to be put to death for his crimes. That's why I like the fact that this guy's name is Robespierre because it echoes what I'm about to talk about. Robespierre had seen that the shit was about to hit the fan. So what did he do? He shot himself in the face to kill himself. But he fucking missed. So mm. he shattered his jaw and he knocked out a bunch of fucking teeth. They come in, they find this pathetic five foot three guy wailing in pain and they throw him in prison overnight with only a wrap to put around his fucking head. Uh. He wasn't in pain for long because the next morning they marched him out, they tucked him into the guillotine and they sliced his fucking head clean off. So that's Robespierre. This Shitty little night. throwaway Shitty night. fucking... Yeah. Didn't they little, kick him first? I don't know. He's like a little I think they kicked him in the mouth before they yes. shot his head off. Yeah, 100%. They ripped the bandage off. Yeah. You know what I mean? And, and then they, they wanted, they wanted him to off. yell. Because yeah, it was like they had his jaw wired shut or something. And they ripped the, right. like, everything off so that when they, you know, that way he could scream before they cut, they cut his head off. 
and the story is not about Rose Pierce, it's just that that's this guy's <laughs> handle. I Sorry. love the fact that I that's just thought that guy's. was fascinating. <laughs> no, I do too. And I think that's cool that that's this guy's fucking handle. But anyway, so this guy Rose Pierce sent to me uh, a day in the life. See if you can guess who it's about. It's April 30th, 1945. And most of this story takes place April 30th, 1945, a day in the life. And most of this story takes place in a subterranean Führer bunker in Berlin. All right. So it's the last yeah. day of Adolf Hitler. Yeah. I think it's cool. Let's go through what Adolf Hitler felt on his last day. I yep. always like to talk about Hitler. And if Robespierre asked me to do it, I'm going to fucking do it. Okay? April 30th, 1945. What happened that day if your name was Adolf Hitler and you were in the Führer bunker in Berlin? Right. right. The, well, Russians, the, the Russians are, are knocking on the door. The Red Army is about to come in. In late April 1945, Berlin was fucking chaotic. Years of war had turned Germany into a battleground, right? Like we talk about the Luftwaffe and all the bombing of London and stuff like that. But just remember what Germany looked like towards the end of the war, like mm -hmm. towards April of 1945. Its cities, its strongholds were all either wiped to the ground or they were definitely under siege. The Red Army had completely circled Berlin, which was now calling upon elderly men, some of the police force, and even children, particularly the Hitler youth, to defend it. But though a battle raged on in the streets, the war was already lost, and Adolf Hitler's time was just about up. He made a public appearance on his 56th birthday. This was Hitler's last public appearance was his 56th birthday, which is April 20th. How do I know his birthday is April 20th? I have a friend who took me to a German restaurant on April 20th, and it wasn't until I sat down did he tell me we were there on April's birth uh, on Hitler's birthday, and then he went every year. That's fucked up. Never went yeah. back, obviously. Uh, four, yeah, yeah. 420, so, always Hitler's birthday. Yeah. So, 56th birthday, he shows up. He was in a ruined garden of the Reich Chancellery where he awarded iron crosses to boy soldiers of the Hitler Youth who are now fighting the Red Army on the front near Berlin. Some of them were as young as 10 years old. So like 10 to 16 was a sweet spot for Hitler Youth. Mm -hmm. And now they're all being given soldiers and saying, go fight the Russians out on the fucking front in Berlin. It's pathetic. Since then, he'd been absent from the public's eye. So that was the 20th. We're getting towards the 30th, right? He'd been absent from the public eye because in reality, he was holed up in a bunker near the Brandenburg Gate in the heart of Berlin, surrounded by his command staff, a few private citizens, and his mistress, Eva Braun. For weeks, bad news funneled into Hitler's hideaway as American forces advanced from the west and the Soviet tanks from the east. Hitler consulted with Werner Haas, his private doctor about the best ways to commit suicide. So he knows this shit's about to hit the fan. And on April 29th, Hitler married Eva Braun. He married her. That was in the morning. And then later that morning, he learned that Heinrich Himmler, the leader of the SS, had given the, ally, uh, given the Allies an offer of immediate surrender. He was outraged by this, especially on his wedding day. And he demanded that Himmler, who was once his close and powerful compatriot, to be arrested. And then he had Hermann Fagelein, who was Himmler's SS representative at the HQ in Berlin. He had him shot. So he got married. He had Himmler's guy shot. And he ordered the arrest of Himmler. But he never was able to get to him. On the afternoon of that day, the 29th, his wedding day, right, he recorded his last will and testament, saying that he intended to choose death rather than, quote, fall into the hands of the enemies and the masses and becoming a spectacle arranged by Jews. So that was part of his last will and testament. Okay? Then Hitler, on this same day, the 29th, heard of the death of Benito Mussolini, essentially his counterpart in Italy, right? Mussolini and his mistress, Claretta Pitak, were executed. M Mussolini and his girlfriend were fucking executed. The bodies of Mussolini and Patacci, not Patacci, I'm sorry, Patacci, were taken to Milan and left in a town square, the Pazali Loreto, where a large angry crowd fucked with their bodies, right? They were hung upside down from the metal girder above a service station on the square. And it was Mussolini's death and the, and the, um, the accounts of what happened to his body that set into motion the last 24 hours of life in Hitler's bunker. 
So let's start early morning, April 30th. April 29th was a doozy. I was saying, wasn't, the there, wasn't there rumors that they like kicked Mussolini's head like a mile down the road? Right, and then they moved his body multiple times. Yeah, I mean, they, yeah, really, so was, they really fucked with it. Right. And think about that as a wedding day. Like the Alanis Morissette song. Like rain on your wedding day if you don't have a good wedding day. Imagine fucking Himmler backstabs you, then Mussolini gets... Mm -hmm. It's just not a good day for him. Not, yeah, no, so, no, no. so the next day is his last day on Earth, April 30th, 1945. At 1 a.m., Field Marshal William Keitel reports that the entire Ninth Army is encircled and that reinforcements will not be able to reach Berlin. So that's the end. Berlin will no longer be able to get anything from the outside because the Red Army has officially smothered it, right? Mm -hmm. At 4 a.m., Major Otto Guntzsche heads for the bathroom only to find Dr. Haas and Hitler's dog handler Fritz Torno feeding cyanide pills to Hitler's beloved German shepherd, Blondie. Haas was apparently testing the efficacy of the cyanide pills that Hitler's former ally, Himmler, had provided him. The capsule works, and the dog dies almost immediately. Mm. So 4 a.m., the German shepherd meets his fate. At 10.30 a.m., Hitler meets with General Helmuth Wielding, who tells him that the end is near. Russians are attacking the nearby Reichstag, and Wilding asks what to do when the troops run out of ammunition. Hitler responds that he'll never surrender Berlin, so Wilding asks for permission to allow his troops to break out of the city as long as their intention never to surrender remains clear. So Wilding's like, okay, you don't want to give up the city. Is it okay if we run away? At 2 o'clock p.m., Hitler and the women of the bunker, Eva Braun, Trattle, Jung, and other secretaries, sit down for lunch. And Hitler promises them that he'll give them all vials of cyanide if they wish to use them. He apologizes for being unable to give them a better farewell present. At 3.30 p.m., roused by the sound of a loud gunshot, Heinz Lynch, who served as Hitler's valet for a decade, opens the door to the study, and right away the smell of almonds, a harbinger of cyanide, waft through the door. Braun and Hitler sit side by side. They're both dead. Braun apparently has taken the cyanide, while Hitler has done the deed with his Walther pistol. According to Lieutenant General Hans Bauer, one of Hitler's most trusted members of staff, these were Hitler's last words. I quote, A man must summon up courage enough to face consequences, and therefore I'm ending it now. I know that tomorrow millions of people will curse me. That's fate. The Russians know perfectly well that I'm here in this bunker, and I'm afraid they'll use gas shells. There are gas locks here, I know, but can you rely on them? In any case, I cannot, and I'm ending it today. At 4 o'clock p.m., Lynch and other residents of the bunker wrap the bodies in blankets, Eva Braun and Hitler's bodies in blankets, carry them upstairs to the garden. As shells are falling all around them, they douse Hitler and Eva Braun's bodies in gasoline, and Joseph Goebbels, Minister of Propaganda, who will kill himself tomorrow, holds out a box of matches. The survivors fumble, they finally light the corpses on fire, and then they head back down to the bunker as Hitler and his new wife burn. On May 1st, Germans who can find a radio are greeted with the tones of Wagner's The Twilight of the Gods. They are lied to one last time and told that Hitler has fallen at his command post in the Reich Chancery, fighting to his last breath against Bolshevism and for Germany. He, he wasn't. He shot himself in the fucking face. And after that, the Fuhrer was dead. That's the last day of Adolf Hitler. I like that. Fuck that, right? Yeah. Love, so that love was that. That's like, a, yeah. that's like an episode of 24, Hitler style. Yeah. I liked it. So that was, uh, yeah, so that was from Robespierre, and that's what I covered. I'm going to mention one real other thing before I leave, and that we're still partnering with that Two Cents thing. So if you guys go to www.twocents.audio slash twisted, if you want to listen to the podcast on that platform, it doesn't matter to us. We don't get paid for it or anything like that. But these people at Two Cents have provided a place where you can leave voice comments and uh, responses to us that I can then answer back and forth with you. So it's Two Cents. And they're also giving away some merch. So if you leave some comments on Two Cents, they'll send you some Twisted History merch. That's www.twocents.audio slash twisted. www.twocents.audio slash twisted. 
the number two C-E-N-T-S dot audio slash twisted. So we can chat on that if that's the way you guys want to listen to us going forward. Otherwise, we have this video thing, which I know people love seeing my fucking face. I don't know about you guys. So it's all okay. What do you have coming up, Phipps? Uh, <clears throat> we've got a lowering the bar tournament coming up. So we're going to have a bracket-like tournament for lowering the bar. You heard it here first. I'm in. Yeah. This is, this is the first. Okay. This is breaking news. We haven't told anyone yet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Seriously, I, was, I just yeah. I just got an email. Yeah, yeah, that's the first anyone's really yeah found out about it, so it's gonna be Ooh, exciting. So, so uh, yeah, sorry, uh, it'll be a bracket style tournament featuring uh, uh, items on lowering the bar, some stuff that we've done in the past, some new stuff, and the winner gets money. So it'll be fun. Fantastic. Alrighty, so that's a uh, twisted history, uh, twisted history of a mixed bag. We're still gonna be traveling. Annie and I. I'm going from San Antonio. I'm gonna touch down in Jersey. Pick up my uh, my lady and my kids. I'm going to head down to the Bahamas next week. So I won't see you guys for a couple of weeks. We're going to try to get another one of these done uh, on the road. And uh, and that's it. Thank you, John, for uh, putting all this together. Thank you, Vibs, for uh, coming on. Thank you, Annie, for all you do. A lot of people don't know about it either. Wow. Um, yeah, we'll see you guys next week on Tristan History.